Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for that hushed silence. Uh, welcome to the 15th annual Hancock Lecture at Hart House, hashtag Hancock 2016. My name is John Monahan, and I'm the warden of Hart House. And I'm, Ale and I'm Alefia Gardiali, a fourth year student at the University of Toronto. It has been my honor this year to be a member of the Hancock Organization Committee. The Hancock Lecture follows in the Hart House tradition of providing a forum where students and non-students alike can engage in conversations, deep discussions, and even an odd debate. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the sacred land on which Hart House and the University of Toronto rests has been a site of human activi activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon well, uh, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Each year, over the past 15 years, a committee has been created comprising of students and staff that identify a topic that is timely and of vital importance and relevance to youth of today as future Canadians. This year, our committee convened at the height of last year's federal, federal elections campaign. This probably influenced our unanimous decision for this year's topic. We hope to grapple with the question on how race, religion, and other key aspects of Canadian identity intersect in often troubling ways with our policy approaches to public security. We think this is an essential topic, and one that is very close to my heart, because immediately before I joined Hart House's warden six months ago, I was the executive director of a small think and do tank called the Mosaic Institute that does a lot of work on the relationship between broad-based meaningful inclusion and healthier, safer societies. And it was in that role that I first met and worked with this year's Hancock lecturer, Aziza Kanji. And so I couldn't be more excited on a personal note that she has accepted our invitation for this evening. Aziza joins a distinguished roster of activists and artists, policymakers, and other emerging thought leaders who have delivered the Hancock lecture over the years. The range and breadth of topics that have been addressed at this podium hints at the exciting opportunity that we have for Hart House to be an ever more inclusive place for the respectful exchange of ideas, the convergence of communities, and the navigation of difference. The Hancock Lecture is always an important event in the annual Hart House calendar, but even more so tonight as we celebrate our 15th anniversary. For a decade and a half, we have come together on evenings such as this to explore big ideas and engage in healthy and constructive dialogue. First launched in 2001, the Hard House Lecture was renamed the Hancock Lecture in 2007 to commemorate and honor the end of Margaret Hancock's 10-year tenureship as a warden of Hard House. Margaret Hancock has, over the past 30 years, made an indelible difference in the lives of both Canadians and peoples of the Global South through her work as a frontline social justice advocate a community educator, and an international development practitioner and, edu and educator. Since 2007, she has been the Chief Executive Officer of Family Service Toronto, one of the nation's largest and most respected social service agencies. In all she does, Margaret distinguishes herself through her commitment in to community building, to innovation, and to learning, which is exactly why we have renamed the lecture after her. So please put your hands together and welcome Mar Margaret Hancock. Hi, everybody. So, oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. oh, wow, thank you so much. That's lovely. Very pretty. See, lovely. <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks to the flowers, and, and thanks so much for inviting me to be part of the lecture tonight. Uh, creating this lecture with students each year remains a highlight for me of my 10 years as Warden of Hart House, and I'm absolutely delighted to see that it still resonates with students uh, today. John asked me to share with you some of the vision and experience of the creation of the Hart House Lecture, and I can 
hear from John and Alefia's introduction that it still lives in the way that we, we hoped it would. Uh, when two dynamic students, Peter McLeod and Mike Morgan, dropped by my office one day 15 years ago to float their idea of an annual lecture, I must admit that my first thoughts were doubtful ones. Do we really need another lecture? And how could this one distinguish itself? But Mike and Peter quickly extinguished my doubts and re replaced them with enthusiasm for their concept. Organized by students, the lecture would inspire a debate about visions of our place in the world and create a public conversation with young people about issues related to personal and collective identity as well as the responsibilities of active citizenship. We hoped to engage the wider community in a discussion about ourselves as individuals and as a country. For Hart House, the gathering place for the University of Toronto and the historic home for debate, discussion, and dissent, the lecture would be a fitting medium through which the house could nurture civic leadership and participation. We hoped that the lecture series would come to occupy a sort of middle space bridging the interests of students who would coordinate the series with the public good. We wanted to expand the capacity of Canadians to create a vibrant, supple, and imaginative nation. We aspired to present lectures which would create more questions than they addressed and draw us into a process of public listening to discover and explore significant ideas as a community. It was the start of the new millennium then and we wanted to reanimate the public sphere. We had a few aspirations. Equally important to the vision for the lecture was the idea that the lecture would feature emerging thinkers, people who are flying a little under the radar for now, seminal voices who are first and foremost of interest to young people. Each autumn, I would invite students interested in creating the lecture to gather one morning every week and it was at 8 a.m., that was their choice, and we would work our way through a process to identify that year's lecturer. The students then contacted the lecturer, worked with them on the content of the lecture, the production of the accompanying book, the artwork for the series, the complimentary programming and broadcasting on CBC's Ideas program, all the publicity and all the logistics. The party afterwards in the warden's apartment was a peak moment in the Hart House year and a real celebration of the monumental accomplishment of the students. Whenever you create an event, you always worry whether anyone will come. The first several lectures were held in the Great Hall and we arranged seating for 500 people. Each year, the hall was filled to overflowing. The students were over the moon and the evenings had a special magic. Our first lecturer was Pico Iyer, author of The Global Soul, whose lecture contemplated imagining Canada an outsider's hope for a global future. The moderator for the Q&A, almost an equally important choice as the lecturer every time, uh, was Ken Wiwa, the Nigerian journalist whose father Ken Sarawiwa was executed by the Nigerian government for his activism in leading a nonviolent campaign against environmental degradation of the land and waters of Ogoni land by the operations of the multinational petroleum industry, especially the Royal Dutch Shell Company. The combination of Pico and Ken was electrifying, just as I am sure the combination of Aziza Kanji and Desmond Cole will be tonight. So let's get to the introductions for the 2016 Hancock Lecture. The topic, so this year, as you heard, students have identified the racialization of public security policies as an urgent concern, a practice that creates very different experiences for different Canadians and that may be in tension with the very mythologies about Canada that we purport to be defending through our implementation of these policies. We Canadians like to think of ourselves as comprising a welcoming and inclusive nation, yet our history relays a darker story from the genocide of Indigenous peoples and the internment of Japanese Canadians to the recent debate over the wearing of the niqab in citizenship ceremonies. So we wonder, what will happen under our new federal government? What will its sunny ways actually entail? And will Canadians be safer as a result? <laughs> 
Here to speak on the subject is Aziza Kanji, a program coordinator at Noor Cultural Center. Aziza is a writer, activist, and a legal scholar who received her JD from U of T's Faculty of Law, and she also holds an LLM specializing in Islamic law from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. She's a frequent contributor to Canadian media, including the National Post, Toronto Star, and Rabble, regarding national security, multiculturalism, and Muslims in Canada. Immediately following the lecture, Aziza will be joined on stage for a discussion and a Q&A moderated by Desmond Cole, an activist, author, and award-winning freelance journalist. He's a weekly columnist with the Toronto Star, and his writing has also appeared in the Torontoist, The Walrus, Now Magazine, Vice, and Ethnic Isle, and Toronto Life, <laughs> most recently. Desmond also hosts a radio program every Sunday afternoon on News Talk 1010 and co-hosts a podcast on Canadian politics called Canada Land Commons. We're very pleased to welcome Desmond and Aziza to Hardhouse, and we very much look forward to an engaging discussion. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podium the 2016 Hancock lecturer, Aziza Khan. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings of peace. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Margaret Hancock. Thank you, Margaret, for establishing this valuable platform, this lecture named in your honor, for discussing issues of national concern in greater depth than is often permitted by our very short media cycle. I am so deeply honored to have been invited to deliver this year's lecture. Thank you, John Monahan and the Hancock Lecture team at Hart House, including the student members of the Hancock Lecture Organizing Committee, Zoe Dill and Cynthia Nevins from the Hart House Programs Department, uh, the Hart House Theater staff, Doug Floyd, Brian Campbell, and the rest of the theater team, Virginia Ise, Andy Vatiliotu, and the rest of the Hart House Communications team, Paul Templin, Aaron Moore, and their colleagues at the Hart House Meetings and Events Department, Emma Arpe Robertson at the Warden's Office, and Ken Stoar and the crew at CIUT Radio. Thank you for your tremendous hard work in organizing the lecture and related programming, and for your desire to address the issue of the racialization of national security and citizenship in Canada, a topic of high stakes and high visibility, but around which it is often difficult to have truly critical conversation. This is a conversation that I hope we will have tonight and on many more occasions after this night. And so thank you to all of you for your interest and for your engagement and for bringing your presence and your wisdom and your experiences to this theater tonight. I'm excited to hear from you and to learn from you in the discussion following the talk. And finally, I want to thank our former Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, Perhaps this expression of gratitude seems unexpected or counterintuitive, but I want to thank Stephen Harper for waging an election campaign that made very visible a particularly obvious form of Islamophobia in Canadian society. Harper's demonization of women who wear the niqab as threats to Canada, so that protecting liberal Canadian values supposedly required the extremely illiberal move of banning veiled women from citizenship ceremonies. His fear-mongering about the menace of what he called Islamicism, which he deployed to push through increasingly aggressive and draconian counterterrorism measures. These were very clear attempts to invoke and manipulate public hostility against Muslims. And indeed, Stephen Harper's politics of racial division yielded fruits of violence. Attacks on women wearing niqab and hijab were front page news, the latest stage in a longer term trajectory of increasing violence against Muslims in Canada, as documented in Statistics Canada data. Even normally right wing commentators, commentators who tend to deny or discount the existence of structural racism in this country, even they acknowledged that Canada had an Islamophobia problem during the last election. 
However, as Professor, Professor Deepa Kumar, author of Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire, points out, anti-Muslim racism is about more than just hate crimes, is about more than just individual opinions, even if they are the ones held by the Prime Minister, and more about, um, more, about more than just isolated explosions of animus against Muslims or people confused for Muslims. Professor Kumar writes about the American context, quote, no doubt Muslims and those who look Muslim endure constant microaggressions, which collectively cause psychological trauma and have impacts on their health and well-being. It is draining to be at the receiving end of such treatment as I am constantly reminded by friends on Facebook. However, Islamophobia is about more than microaggressions, daily acts of hostility, hate crimes, and even job discrimination are the outward manifestations of a system that is fundamentally racist. It is this system we must name, understand, and organize against if we are to put an end to anti-Muslim racism. Islamophobia is an ideology that has come to be accepted as normal, as common sense in the war on terror era. In this sense, it is not just an individual bias, but a systematic body of ideas which make certain constructions of Muslims that they are prone to violence, that they are misogynistic, that they are driven by rage and lack rationality, makes these ideas appear natural. The naturalized stereotype of Muslim men as abusers of women and children at home and as terrorists in the world at large, has been used in the war on terror since its inception to justify international militarization and domestic securitization. The danger is that we will fail to see the continuities between Stephen Harper's race baiting and this broader, more deeply entrenched systematic body of ideas about Muslims, as well as the systematic bodies of ideas about other racialized groups in Canada. The danger is that we will disconnect Harper's rhetoric and policies from the racial structure of the national security state that predates Harper's reign as prime minister and may very well survive its termination, permitting us to persist in fantasies of Canadian colorblindness or post-racism. It is very tempting to relegate racism to a past we have overcome or to a future we have avoided. It is too easy to project racism onto other times or onto other people, onto those like Stephen Harper or Donald Trump, who ostentatiously brandish Islamophobia as a political weapon. It is far more difficult to confront the normalized race thinking that undergirds the growth of the national security state that is now a part of our everyday lives. In Canada, this growth has meant, among other things, first, an extra $92 billion allocated to national security spending in the decade after 9-11. Second, the expansion of state powers of surveillance which we now know have been used to monitor and stifle activists and dissenters. And third, the proliferation and broadening of terrorism offenses to include, since the passage of the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015, or Bill C-51, as it is more popularly known, such vague crimes as, quote, promoting or, or advocating the commission of terrorism offenses in general including in private communications. Even seasoned experts on Canadian counterterrorism law and policy, like professors Kent Roach and Craig Forsays, confess to being baffled about the meaning of terrorism offenses in general, as well as the purpose of criminalizing the advocacy or promotion of such a potentially broad range of activities including activities that are vital to the functioning of a healthy democracy, like activities of dissent. The human costs of post-9-11 counterterrorism practices under both liberal and conservative governments 
are apparent in myriad personal stories of rights abused and freedoms curtailed in the name of Canada's security. Some well known, others relatively absent from Canadian public consciousness. From Muslim men wrongfully smeared as terrorists by the Canadian government, being targeted in the war on terror has quite literally been a terrifying experience. Included on this list of victims made profoundly insecure for the sake of Canadian security are Maher Arar, Ahmed Abu Al Mati, Abdullah Al Malki, and Mu'ayyid Nuruddin who were secretly imprisoned and tortured in Syria and also in Egypt in the case of Ahmed al Mati, with what the United Nations Committee Against Torture has condemned as complicity by Canadian governmental agencies. For example, Canadian agents sent questions for the torturers to use during their interrogations. While Maher Arar has received compensation from the government for his ordeal, the rest continue to fight lengthy legal battles against the government for recompense. And as the Toronto Star reported on Saturday, the Liberal government has adopted the former Conservative government's legal opposition to Al Mati, Al Malki, and Northern's claims for apology and compensation, even though they voted in favor of their cause while they were in opposition. On this list of victims of security is Abu Sufyan Abdurazik who was stranded in Sudan for six years, where he was detained, interrogated, and tortured, while successive Canadian governments actively thwarted his efforts to exercise a fundamental charter right and return home to Canada. There's Benamar Banata, who arrived in Canada as a refugee claimant from Algeria, only to be illegally transferred to the United States the day after 9-11 and imprisoned for five years in conditions described by a United Nations working group as torture. There are the secret trial five, Mohamed Majoub, Mahmoud Jabala, Mohamed Harkat, Hassan Amre, and Adil Sharkawi, who were indefinitely detained as threats to national security without charge and on the strength of secret evidence which they were not permitted to see under Canada's security certificate regime. Mohamed Harkat is currently facing deportation to possible torture in Syria under the certi security certificate. And there are the many other, less public but still damaging, occasions on which Muslim men and Muslim women have been represented as un-Canadian or anti-Canadian or a danger to Canada in the media and in government reports, in airports and at borders. Canadian born, perhaps, but not really Canadian. We must ask ourselves, how has the turbaned, bearded Muslim man become the paradigmatic figure of the terrorist, even though, according to internal CSIS documents recently described in the Toronto Star, right-wing and white supremacist violence is actually a greater security threat than violence by Muslims? Why do Canadian government reports insist that Muslims have been responsible for the majority of terrorist attacks in Europe and North America, even though American studies indicate that more people have been killed by right-wing and white supremacist political violence than by Muslims, and even though reports from Europol, the European policing agency, hardly an arm of the supposed global Muslim jihad seeking to lull you all into a false sense of complacency, even though reports from Europol demonstrate that since 9-11, Muslims have been responsible for only a tiny percentage of political violence on that continent. Why is the Boston Marathon bombing memorialized as a terroristic assault on the West, including on Canadian news, which marked the one-year anniversary of the attack with extensive coverage? While the most fatal act of violence that occurred that year in the United States, the shooting in the Washington Navy Yard by Aaron Alexis, which killed 12, is largely forgotten if it was even accorded any attention in the first place. Why were the two Muslim men who plotted to blow up a via rail train labeled terrorists 
while the non-Muslims who planned a mass shooting in Halifax on Valentine's Day were not described as terrorists by then Justice Minister Peter McKay, but rather as murderous misfits whose supposed lack of a cultural motivation saved them from the stigma of being known as terrorists, as enemies of the nation. Out of the fabric of violence enveloping our world, how do we pick out certain threads and know that they deserve to be called terrorism? Barbaric acts antithetical to humanity and to civilization, even while other massive projects of violence are represented as exercises on behalf of humanity and civilization. And we must also ask ourselves, who is the nation protected by national security? On the surface, the answer to this question may appear obvious. The nation is Canada, eh? But the simple conflation of the nation with the borders of the Canadian state is complicated by the racial politics of the war on terror. On the one hand, our sense of national identification in the war on terror exceeds the territorial limitations of the state so that we feel our security is bound up with the security of those in other countries of the so-called West, the United States or France, for example. The sense of identification is manifest in hashtags like Je suis Charlie or Pray for Paris, identification which was conspicuously absent for victims of bombings in Beirut or Istanbul or Kunduz or so many other places populated with people who are not considered us, but them. On the other hand, not all individuals and communities within Canada are included in the imagined community of the nation and its national security. While Bill C-51, the new anti-terrorism legislation, for example, claims to be necessary to safeguard, quote, the people of Canada from, quote, threats to their lives and their security, not all Canadians are represented as belonging equally to this sphere of people whose lives and security merit protection. On the contrary, certain Canadians are depicted as the ones the rest of us need defending from, as the sources of insecurity rather than the beneficiaries of security. And the threat posed by these internal enemies is used to justify the general erosion of rights and freedoms. NYU professor Arun Kundani has described the national security state as a racialized panopticon, meaning that those publicly perceived to be the panopticon's primary targets are racialized as different and dangerous, dampening opposition to the state's intrusions and abuses. Professors Deepa Kumar and Arun Kunnani point out that while the exposure of the NSA's massive warrantless data collection program in the United States generated widespread condemnation, the revelation that Muslims were specifically targeted for surveillance attracted far less attention. Indeed, a July 2014 poll for the Arab American Institute found that 42% of Americans think that it is justifiable for law enforcement agencies to profile Arab Americans or American Muslims. While many objected to the US government collecting private data on ordinary citizens, and I think we should think critically about the racial inflection of what who an ordinary citizen is, Muslims tend to be seen as reasonable targets of suspicion simply because they are Muslim. In Canada, also, while the state's identification of environmental activists as a threat to the security of Canada was condemned as outrageous, an abuse of state power, the overwhelming focus on Muslims as the predominant threat has gone largely unremarked. Despite the wealth of data indicating otherwise, the assumption of a Muslim male monopoly on terrorism is so hegemonic that it is virtually taken as common sense, even among many critics of the national security state. And as counterterrorism moves from punishing acts of violence that have already been executed, 
towards preventing terrorism that hasn't been committed yet, from crime to pre-crime. The state's attention shifts increasingly from examining what people have actually done towards scrutinizing who people are and what's in their heads and who they know. Ideas about race infuse seemingly mundane actions with an aura of danger. For instance, in the case of Ahmed al Mati, who was wrongfully identified as a terrorist threat by Canadian government agencies and tortured in Syria and Egypt because of this, the fact that he had drawn up a will before embarking on the Hajj pilgrimage, which is a common practice among Muslims, was treated as suspicious, as signaling his desire for martyrdom. Also treated as suspicious was his possession of a government-issued map of Ottawa, even though Mr. Almathi was a truck driver, making a map a very reasonable thing for him to possess. Risk is read onto certain bodies, Maps and wills, when wielded by such bodies, become red flags. Beards and traditional clothing become omens of violent radicalization. Although it should be noted that the American Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, did list, quote, face pale from recent shaving of beard as one of the suspicious signs for officers to look out for at airports. So really, you're damned if you shave and you're damned if you don't. <laughs> Just a tip for any of you uh, traveling through airports um, with beards or without beards. The racialization of risk is only exacerbated by Bill C-51, our new anti-terrorism legislation, which increases the scope of preemptive action to prevent terrorism. Lawyers Clayton Ruby and Nader Hassan describe the type of scenario that might fall within the ambit of C-51. Six Muslim young adults stand in front of a mosque late at night in heated discussion in some foreign language. They may be debating the merits of a new Drake album. They may be talking about video games or sports or girls or advocating the overthrow of the Harper government. Who knows? There's no evidence one way or the other, just stereotypes. But the new standard for arrest and detention, reason to suspect that they may commit an act, is so low that an officer may be inclined to arrest and detain them in order to investigate further. And now, officers will no longer need to ask themselves whether the arrest is necessary. They could act on mere suspicion that an arrest is likely to prevent any terrorist activity. Yesterday, the Muslim men were freely exercising constitutional rights to freedom of expression and assembly. Today, they are arrestable. The construction of certain racialized groups as dangerous to the nation, in Canada perhaps, but not truly of Canada, draws on longer histories of nation making through racial exclusion and securitization. As Professor Sunera Thobani demonstrates in her excellent book, Exalted Subjects, Studies in the Making of Race and Nation in Canada, Canadian national identity was produced through the exaltation of the white Canadian subject as against, first, the non-preferred race, that is, non-white immigrant, who is marked for exclusion and marginalization, and second, the Indian, who is marked for extermination, assimilation, and dispossession. Let us recall the acknowledgement of indigenous territory at the beginning of this event. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Let us hold in our minds this recognition of the settler colonial foundations of the Canadian state and consider seriously its implications for how we understand current discourses of national security. If as the eminent scholar of settler colonialism, Patrick Wolf, contends, settler colonialism is an enduring structure and not just a one-time event. If settler colonialism is a structure of the present and not just an event of the past, what is the significance of Canada's founding as a settler colonial state predicated on the elimination of the land's indigenous nations and the exclusion and marginalization of non-European immigrants 
What is the significance of this founding in understanding the current dynamics of counterterrorism in Canada? As philosopher Jacques Derrida observed, the violences involved in founding a political order are intimately connected to the violences involved in preserving it. How do the interconnected histories of violence against Canada's non-European others live on in our rhetorics and practices of national security, despite the official policy of multiculturalism, which has replaced the original project of building a white Canada? In his book, The Muslims Are Coming, exclamation mark, Professor Konani describes a very revealing poster he saw in a Texas restaurant while traveling through the United States researching counterterrorism policy and its impacts on Muslim communities. The poster depicted a man in a turban being lynched, and the caption read, let's play cowboys and Iranians, with Iranians in all caps so you could really get the full force of the clever wordplay and effect there. Graphically superimposing the anti-black racism of lynching upon the anti-indigenous racism of settler colonialism, upon the anti-Muslim and anti-Arab and anti-Iranian racism of the war on terror. In the poster, as in life, these multiple discourses of violence are intertwined, reinforcing and nourishing each other to construct the specter of racially different threat, of bodies that need to be violently eliminated or subjugated or deported or surveilled for the nation to be secure. The deep connections between the domestic violence of colonialism against indigenous peoples and the external violence of war against Muslims and others are evident in the nomenclature employed by the American military, in the use of Geronimo as the code name for Osama bin Laden in the mission to assassinate him, Geronimo being an Apache leader who resisted the incursion of US and Mexican forces on tribal land, in the use of the term Indian country to describe enemy territory in the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, in the use of phrases like Black Hawk and Tomahawk as names for weaponry to be deployed on racialized bodies around the world. These connections are also manifest in legal discourse. Cornell law professor Aziz Rana traces the legal logic of the war on terror to the American so-called frontier wars between American settlers and the land's indigenous peoples. The representation of indigenous peoples as barbaric others in those wars justifying the suspension of the normal laws of war applying between civilized, that is, European nations, resembles current arguments for the suspension or reinterpretation of international humanitarian law in so-called asymmetrical conflicts with terrorists, permitting more extensive use of violence against them, with Guantanamo Bay being a particularly spectacular and well-known instance of this violence, but it's really a network of violence that is global. In Canada, the colonization of indigenous nations and lands occurred primarily through the development of networks of surveillance and control, rather than through overt military violence, although the force of direct military intervention always remained available. Professor Keith Smith shows in his book Liberalism, Surveillance, and Resistance, Indigenous Communities in Western Canada, how this disciplinary surveillance network, quote, operated to facilitate the expansion of Anglo-Canadian liberal capitalist values, structures, and interests as normal, natural, and beyond reproach. At the same time, it worked to exclude or restructure the economic political, social, and spiritual tenets of indigenous cultures. The most significant physical impact of this surveillance network is related to the transfer of land from indigenous to settler control. Preconceived notions of, of Indianness, reinforced by knowledge constructed through surveillance, served to justify the exclusion of indigenous people from the right to own land and to equal participation in political structures. The surveillance and securitization of indigenous populations continues, 
even if the language used to legitimize this surveillance and securitization has changed. Micmac lawyer, activist, and professor Pamela Palmiter reminds us, historically, First Nations were viewed as primitive and savages. It is no longer acceptable to call us savages, so the new word is terrorist, a word used to justify a whole series of unjustified surveillance, enforcement, and military actions against our people. While the discourse of terrorism applied to Muslim populations serves to justify expulsion from the political community at home and the waging of the war on terror abroad, the labeling of indigenous activism in Canada as terrorism functions to delegitimize opposition to the settler colonial state and its denial of indigenous sovereignty, rights, and security. State efforts to suppress indigenous resistance have frequently been conducted like military campaigns. At El Sepultog First Nation in 2013, where anti-fracking protesters were met with 700 heavily armed RCMP officers with pepper spray and with rubber bullets. At Gustafsson Lake in 1995, where the RCMP deployed 400 tactical assault team members, five helicopters, two surveillance planes, and nine armored personnel carriers to dispel the Sekupemk's occupation in support of their land claim. And at Kanesatake, or Oka, in 1990, where the Canadian Army stood off for 78 days against Mohawks pro protesting commercial encroachment on their traditional burial grounds. During the so-called Oka crisis, the Canadian Police Association published paid announcements in Canadian newspapers bearing the message, we oppose terrorism. While the coincidence of Oka with the Gulf War in Iraq inspired Jacques Perizot, leader of the Parti Québécois at the time, to proclaim, there's a crisis in Oka, just like there's a crisis in Iraq. In the post 9-11 era, Security infrastructure and instruments developed to manage the Muslim terrorist threat, such as the Integrated National Security Enforcement Teams, or INSETs, have also been employed to target indigenous groups resisting environmentally detrimental projects on indigenous land. And the stereotype of oil producing states in the Middle East as supporters of terrorism is used by lobbyists promoting development of the Canadian tar sands as an ethical oil alternative to the terrorist oil of the Middle East, simultaneously demonizing indigenous and environmental resistance to the tar sands and justifying militarism abroad and securitization at home. The specters of Muslim terrorism and indigenous terrorism fuel each other, obscuring the violence of colonialism and the violence of war. As I end, I want to acknowledge the incompleteness and inadequacy of what I have presented here to you tonight. I want to finish with some words about some of the things that I could not say words about in the main body of my talk, due both to limitations of time and structure and to the limitations of my own knowledge. I did not talk about the internment of Japanese Canadians and Japanese Americans during World War II, a history which is vital for understanding the present construction of racialized internal enemies during this time of seemingly perpetual war, the war on terror. In the United States, legal precedents established to uphold the large-scale race-based internment of those of Japanese descent during World War II have been cited to legitimize race-based measures adopted against Muslims and Arabs post 9-11. On the other, more auspicious hand, Japanese American communities have built solidarity with Muslim and Arab communities through the similarities of their histories as racial suspects, as sinister enemies within. In Canada, too, the dynamics of the Japanese dispossession and internment are highly instructive for us today not as an aberrant black mark on an otherwise pristine Canadian history of multicultural tolerance, resolved by the payment of redress, but rather as a case study in how racial logics work to construct enemies deserving such apparently exceptional measures. <laughs> 
which, as it turns out, may not be quite so exceptional as we might like to believe. This episode also reveals some of the connections between the discourses and institutions of external war and those of internal settler colonialism. For example, in bureaucrats' proposed plan to use residential schools as venues for the internment of Japanese, although ultimately this plan was not executed. I know that there are members of the audience here tonight doing invaluable work on recovering this history, and I hope that we will have the opportunity to hear from them. I did not talk about the ways racialized and marginalized communities experience policing in Canada, including through practices such as carding, which Desmond Cole has done extensive and very important work on. Policing is one important site where certain communities are racialized and represented as threats to the safety of Canada in ways that also intersect and overlap with the racial politics of national security. I very much look forward to hearing Desmond's thoughts on this and on many other things in the discussion. I did not talk about our immigration system, a system which employs violence against migrants to enforce borders originally forged through colonial violence. And the new web-based project Never Home is an excellent resource on the Canadian immigration regime for those of you who would uh, like to learn more about it. Immigration law has been an important tool for the state in its crusade for national security, since it presents fewer obstacles in terms of due process than does criminal law. The security certificate regime I mentioned earlier, for example, under which several men have been um, held indefinitely using secret, uh, secret evidence, this is an immigration law measure used only against non-citizens, not a criminal law measure available against everyone. As University of Toronto law professor Audrey Macklin observes, Canadians have long tolerated serious abrogations of rights and freedoms for non-citizens that would likely not be permitted against citizens. Addressing the discriminatory nature of national security policy requires us to pay attention to laws wielded against non-citizens, not only those wielded against citizens. It is inadequate to simply defend the rights of Canadians, to proclaim a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, even though that sentiment is very welcome, without also reflecting on the vulnerability of those who are not Canadian, but made subject to Canadian state power and violence in the name of national security and border control. And there are many other things which I have not mentioned, even in this list of things not mentioned although I hope that some of them will come up in the discussion we will have together. It is important to highlight these exclusions because the colonial legacy sustains itself through divisions by cutting apart what is connected. The colonial legacy sustains itself through divisive logic such as race to distance us from each other so that we cannot see how our experiences and struggles are related across difference and how our seemingly separate presence are built from conjoined histories. We need to apprehend the structure of the whole in order to work at dismantling any part of it. Otherwise, we may inadvertently end up further entrenching or strengthening one aspect of the state's racializing and exclusionary structure while attempting to weaken another. For example, when as Muslim Canadians, we uncritically appeal to our rights as citizens to mitigate the abuses of national security without paying attention to the violences of indigenous dispossession and genocide and non-citizen exclusion embedded in the institution of Canadian citizenship. We need to listen to each other across the ways we've been made to fear each other, to think of each other as threats rather than allies. We need to work to understand each other across the ways our desires have been made incommensurable to each other. And we need to build solidarity across the ways we've been made complicit in each other's oppression and marginalization. Solidarity does not assume that our struggles are the same struggles, or that our pain is the same pain, or that our hope is for the same future, writes philosopher Sara Ahmed. Solidarity involves commitment and work as well as the recognition that even if we do not have the same feelings, 
or the same lives or the same bodies, we do live on common ground. We now call this common ground we live on Canada, but it has been Turtle Island for far longer than it has been Canada. Other worlds exist on the undersides of the national security settler colonial state. From them, can we together imagine other, radically just and equal, ways of living together in peace and security? Thank you. <laughs>